بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم وصلى الله على سيدنا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه ومن تبعهم بإحسان إلى يوم الدين أما بعد الحمد لله نحمد الله سبحانه وتعالى ونشكره ونستعينه ونستغفره ونعوذ بالله من شرور أنفسنا وسيئات أعمالنا من يهده الله فلا مضل له ومن يضلل فلا هادي له الحمد لله إن شاء الله نتابع ما كنا في الأسبوع الماضي continue on um, but before I go into inshallah the first hadith which is really uh, an amazing hadith from Imam al-Bukhari um, traditionally the the uh, when, when you studied hadith you began with the musalsal balawaliya and the musalsal hadith tradition is still continued uh, throughout the Muslim world they continue it in in uh, all the Muslim countries where there's still knowledge, uh, you have this tradition with, amongst the scholars and the students, like myself of scholars, um, who basically relate to you uh, the, uh, the chain and then the, um, the musalsal is musalsalun uh, so Imam al-Baqoni says that the, the musalsal is something where there's something in the hadith that is replicated throughout the transmission. So one of the most famous uh, ones in terms of the just the nukat of Ahl al-Hadith is the qabda ala al-lahya. So the Prophet Sallallahu uh, related uh, a hadith and then qabda ala lahiyatihi. So every rawi would pull, grab their beard. Um, Imam Dahlawi's daughter, when she would um, relate the hadith, she would grab her chin. Uh, so that's the the uh, the musalsal. Uh, there are many like the adiyafa bil aswadain, water and dates. So uh, when we used to visit uh, Sheikh Ahmed Jabir Jibran, Allah one of the great scholars from Yemen, from Tihama, um, who was uh, anybody who had the good fortune of, uh, of knowing him and visiting him, spending time with him, he always did the Mosel Salat. Like it was just something that he would always do. Uh, he was a muhaddith and a Shafi'i faqih. He was a umdah of the Shafi'iya. He was really there main faqih in Mecca, so he wrote several really uh, useful books, a book on usul al makiya on the Shafi'i usul. Uh, he has a book also on the um, uh, sarf. He has a book on, uh, he did nadam of Imam al-Bayhaqi, Shu'ab al-Iman. So he has many books, but he was just a really amazing uh, scholar. I, I once, um, I, I, I've got a brand new uh, watch like a stopwatch, uh, the, uh, sorry, a pocket watch, because a lot of the older ulama, they all used pocket watch. This Sheikh Ma'ashuk nodding his head, because that's, you just, I, for whatever reason, they would have the pocket watch. Um, but he had this po really old pocket watch. So I bought a brand new one, and I went and I asked him if I could trade with him. And he looked at mine, it was brand new, and then he looked at, he said, he said, yeah, I'll be cheating you. And I said, no, 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 I, I'll, I'll, I think I'll get the better deal. So we exchanged watches. It's, it stopped right when we got out of the haram, the hudud, it stopped working. And I could never get it to work again. And I think the watch was upset, you know, because it was, it, he used it to do his prayer times in the haram, and I'm taking it to California. Yeah, it doesn't work. So, but I still have the watch, but it doesn't work, so... Um, but he, uh, he always did the musalsal, and he was the first person that I heard the musalsal barawaliya with Sheikh Abdullah al-Qadi in Mecca, and he, was, uh, he took it from Yasin al-Fadani, who was called the Musnad of the Hijaz. He, he was really one of the last great muhadithun. But I was fortunate also to hear it from Sheikh Muhammad uh, Abu al-Hud al-Yaqubi, who for people that know him, they know, uh, I, I think, inshallah, have some idea of the level of his scholarship. But for the people that don't know him, uh, he's the son of uh, a, a long line of really ulama from the, uh, the, the Hassani um, scholars of Morocco. 
the Yaqubi family, but his father, uh, Sheikh Ibrahim al Yaqubi, was one of the great scholars of the uh, of Syria, and he um, he was also a um, a uh, quite rare. He was a faqih in both madhabs of the Maliki and the Hanafi. So Sheikh uh, Muhammad grew up learning both madhabs, which is very unusual. Um, it's it's difficult enough to learn one madhab, but to learn two. So th I'm going to do this first, just for the barakah of it. I'm not from I'm definitely not from this, uh, you know, the people of this uh, science, but for the barakah to keep these things alive in our ummah. Um, this, uh, this is the, uh, the musalsal bil awwaliyah, which means the first hadith, the salsala the, the in it, what's, what's the link in this is that they, this was the first hadith they heard. And then there's haqiqa and idafa. So is it, is it was the first hadith they heard haqiqatan or idafatan as a musalsal? So uh, for me, when I first heard this from uh, both of them, I think it was musalsal bil awaliya haqiqatan. Um, and I was fortunate to read hadith with uh, both of those scholars um, and benefited greatly from their knowledge. But Sheikh Muhammad is a dabat in, in his asanid. So uh, we're going to read it for the barakah of these names, also to keep the names alive, because one of the things when you think about it, everything that we have is from these ulama. And one of the things that uh, traditionally the Muslims did, like on the 17th of Ramadan, they would recite the names of the people of Badr just to keep their names alive. Uh, there's a great blessing in just their names. They, the, the, in, 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 the, the ulama, they say, بِذِكَرَ الصَّالِحِينَ تَتَنَزَّلَ الرَّحْمَاتِ You know, just by mentioning their names, uh, rahma descends on us. So uh, I'll do this in Arabic. Alhamdulillah, Rabbil Alameen, wa afdara salati wa tamus taslima ala habibi Rabbil Alameen, Sayyidina Muhammad, wa ala alihi wa sahbihi ajma'in, amma ba'd. يقول العبد الفقير إلى رحمة ربه حمز يوسف قد رويت هذا الحديث بالسمع بأورية حقيقية عن عدد من العلماء الأجلاء أخص بالذكر منهم العلامة شيخ محمد أبو الهدى العقوبي الحسني الإدريسي والعلامة الشيخ أحمد جابر جبران رحمهم الله وقد اقتصرت هنا على إسناد واحد اختصارا وتسهيلا حدثنا شيخنا العلامة محمد أبو الهدى ليعقوبي الحسني الإدريسي ابن العلامة الكبير العارف الشهير إمام المالكية ثم الحنفية في الجامع الأموي الكبير بدمشق السيد شيخ إبراهيم ليعقوبي الحسني الإدريسي وهو أول حديث سمعته منه عن العلامة الكبير العارف الشهير السيد شيخ محمد المكي بن محمد بن جعفر الكتاني الحسني الإدريسي مفتي الماركية في براد الشام وهو أول حديث سمعته منه عن السيد أحمد بن إسماعيل بن زين العابدين البرزنجي الحسيني الشافعي مفتي الشافعية بالمدينة المنورة وهو أول حديث سمعته منه عن والده السيد إسماعيل ابن زين العابدين البرزنجي الحسيني الشافعي وهو أول حديث سمعته منه عن الشيخ صالح بن محمد الفلاني العمري وهو أول حديث سمعته منه عن شمس الدين محمد بن محمد المغربي وهو أول حديث سمعته منه عن مسند الحجاز الإمام عبد الله بن سالم البصري وهو أول حديث سمعته منه عن الحافظ شمس الدين محمد بن علاء الدين البابلي المصري وهو أول حديث سمعته منه قال حدثنا الشهاب أحمد بن محمد الشلبي الحنفي وهو أول حديث سمعته منه قال حدثنا جمال الدين يوسف ابن شيخ الإسلام زكريا الأنصاري الشافعي وهو أول حديث سمعت منه قال حدثنا برهان الدين إبراهيم ابن علي ابن أحمد القلقشندي وهو أول حديث سمعت منه قال حدثنا شهاب أحمد ابن محمد ابن أبي بكر المقدسي الشهير بالواسطي وهو أول حديث سمعت منه قال حدثنا صدر الدين أبو الفتح محمد ابن محمد ابن إبراهيم الميدومي وهو أول حديث سمعت منه قال حدثنا مسند مصر نجيب الدين أبو الفرج 
عبد اللطيف ابن عبد المنعم بن الصقلي الحراني الحنبلي وهو اول حديث سمعت منه قال حدثنا الحافظ ابو الفرج عبد الرحمن ابن علي المعروف بن الجوزي البغدادي الحنبلي وهو اول حديث سمعت منه قال حدثنا محدث الامام ابو السعيد الاسماعيل بن احمد النيسابوري وهو اول حديث سمعت منه قال حدثنا ابي الحافظ ابو صالح احمد بن عبد الملك المؤذن النيسابوري وهو اول حديث سمعت منه قال حدثنا مسند نيسابور ابو الطاهر محمد ابن محمد ابن معين الزيادي وهو اول حديث سمعت منه قال حدثنا مسند خراسان أبو حامد أحمد بن محمد بن يحيى بن البلال البزاز النيسابوري وهو أول حديث سمعت منه قال حدثنا شيخ الفقهاء بمكة أبو محمد عبد الرحمن بن بشري بن الحكم العبدي النيسابوري وهو أول حديث سمعت منه وهنا ينتهي التسلسل آه لا قال حدثني أمير المؤمنين سفيان بن عيينة وهو أول حديث سمعت منه وهنا ينتهي المسلسل عن أبي محمد عمر بن دينار المكي عن التابعي الجليل أبي قابوس المتوفى بعد المية عن الصحابي الجليل سيدنا عبد الله بن عمر بن العاص رضي الله عنهما قال قال رسول الله صلى الله عليه وسلم الراحمون يرحمهم الرحمن تبارك وتعالى يرحم من في الأرض يرحمكم من في السماء وفي رواية يرحمكم بالرفع على الدعاء يرحمكم من في السماء الحمد لله وهذا في 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 مسند إمام أحمد وأيضا في البخاري في الأدب المفرد بغير التسلسل فالحمد لله الله يتقبل إن شاء الله و يجازي هؤلاء العلماء عن خير الجزاء. May Allah reward all of the men in that uh, in that chain for carrying the knowledge uh, to us. May Allah subhanahu wa taala bless them. Uh, so we're going to start now with Imam Al Bukhari's uh, first hadith that he relates on Aisha ta Ummi al Mu'minin رضي الله عنها أنها قالت أول ما بدأ به رسول الله صلى الله عليه وسلم من الوحي الرؤيا الصالحة في النوم فكان لا يرى رؤيا إلا جاءت مثل فلق الصبح ثم حبب إليه الخلاء وكان يخلو بغار حراء فيتحنث فيه وهو تعبد والليالي ذات العدد قبل أن ينزع إلى أهله ويتزود لذلك ثم يرجع إلى خديجة فيتزودوا لمثلها حتى جاءه الحق وهو في غار حراء فجاءه الملك فقال اقرأ قال ما أنا بقارئ قال فأخذني فغطني حتى بلغ مني الجهد ثم أرسلني فقال اقرأ فقلت ما أنا بقارئ فأخذني فغطني الثانية حتى بلغ مني الجهد ثم أرسلني فقال اقرأ فقلت ما أنا بقارئ فأخذني فغطني الثالثة ثم أرسلني فقال اقرأ باسم ربك الذي خلق خلق الإنسان من علق اقرأ ورب لك وربك الأكرم فرجع بها رسول الله يرجف فؤاده فدخل على خديجة بنت خويلد رضي الله عن عنها فقال زملوني زملوني فزملوه حتى ذهب عنه الروع فقال لي خديجة وأخبرها الخبر لقد خشيت على نفسي فقالت له خديجة كلا والله ما يخزيك الله أبدا إنك لا تصل الرحمة وتحمل الكلا وتكسب المعدوم وتقري الضيف وتعين على النوائب الحق فانطلقت به خديجة حتى أتت به ورقة ابن نوفل ابن أسد ابن عبد العزة ابن عمي خديجة 
وكان امرأ تنصر في الجاهلية وكان يكتب الكتاب وكان يكتب الكتاب العبراني فيكتب من الإنجيل بالعبرانية ما شاء الله أن يكتب وكان شيخا كبيرا وقد عميا فقالت له خديجة يا ابن عم اسمع من ابن أخيك فقال له ورقة يا ابن أخي ماذا ترى فأخبره رسول الله صلى الله عليه وسلم خبر ما رأى فقال له ورقته هذا الناموس الذي نزل الله على موسى يا ليتني فيها جذعا ليتني أكون حيا إذ يخرجك قومك فقال رسول الله صلى الله عليه وسلم أمخرجيهم أو أمخرجيهم قال نعم لم يأتي رجل قط بمثل ما جئت به إلا عودية وإن يدركني يومك أنصر نصرا مؤزرا ثم لم ينشب ورقة أن توفي وفتر الوحي الحمد لله So this hadith is from Aisha radiallahu anhu, Umm al-Mu'mineen. And Aisha obviously heard this from the Prophet sallallahu because uh, she was, uh, I mean, her age is, is, is uh, debated. Uh, in the hadith that she, that's related in, in al-Bukhari and in, in Muslim, in Al-Bukhari, it says that she was six when there was a betrothal and then nine when she uh, entered into the house of the Prophet Sallallahu in this, But if you, if you actually look at the... She dies in 58 after Hijrah, but her sister Asma died in 73 and she was 100 years old. And Asma was 17 years older than Aisha. So Asma would have been 27 at the time of, of uh, the Prophet Sallallahu death, which means she would have been 17 uh, when he made Hijrah, which means that Aisha was probably 15 uh, when she entered in the house in the second year of Hijrah. And, and the, 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 the reason for that, there's, there's several reasons. One of them is that when the Prophet came in, she was with all her friends. And in the Hadith, this is when she first comes in, they all run away. And children loved the Prophet So these were girls that were already entered into their uh, puberty. They were not children because the children loved the Prophet and they would not have run away from him. But out of shyness, they were already at that age. In any case, his, his, the age of Aisha was never an issue for pre-modern peoples. You, uh, Washington Irving in his famous uh, book, which is not a great book. I mean, it's a terrible book in some ways. But he wrote a book about the Prophet, the life of the Prophet. It was a bestseller in the United States. Another uh, man, the great, one of the uh, descendants of uh, George Bush, whose name is Reverend George Bush, also wrote a biography. So people were very interested in the Prophet in the 19th century because of the Ottomans and because the Americans were uh, involved in commerce and the Muslims uh, were in the Mediterranean. In any case, none of them, men they mention Aisha's age, none of them make a comment about it because it just simply was not an issue for them. It was very common for uh, girls to get married. According to the Oxford Encyclopedia of the Bible, Mary was probably about 12 or 13 when she was impregnated. So this was very common in the past. Obviously, this goes under Orf, so in America, in these times, it would be inappropriate for, for these times because it goes under Orf. And Orf, Al Ada is muhakkama in our usul. You follow the, the, the Orf of a people. So in some places, they marry very early, in other places, they don't. And the, and the, and the Sharia recognizes that and acknowledges that. 
Um, so that's important. But she was a brilliant woman. She had a photographic memory. She memorized, uh, in fact, Al-Hakim in, in, in the Mustadrak says that we owe a fourth of our deen to Aisha. She also corrected Sahaba. She corrected Abu Huraira in the famous hadith about um, taking a bad omen from a atiratu min al-thalath, al-mar'a, wa-dabba wa-dar. And when Aisha heard that, she said, it's, that's not true. He, he, he misquoted it. The Prophet said, Kanu yaquru fil jahiliya. They used to say fil in jahiliya that bad omen are three. And, and so she actually negated that. So the point being, um, she is one of the great uh, scholars of our religion, radiallahu um, anha. And she's obviously the daughter of the second Thaniel ithnain idhuma fil ghar. Abu Bakr al-Siddiq radiallahu So she said that the, the, the revelation began with the Prophet sallallahu alayhi So it began as, as a true vision, a sound vision in his sleep. So this was the beginning of revelation. We know that a true dream is 146 of prophecy. So every human being, even uh, people outside of you know, the faith can have access to true dreams. They occur. There are many people that have become Muslim through true dreams. I know somebody who actually saw the Prophet ﷺ before he became Muslim who told him to become Muslim. So that does happen and why some people are gifted with those things and why others, we, we, that's not discernible to us. Allah knows best. In any case, a true dream this was the beginning of revelation because it's a preparation. He would not see a dream except that it came like the breaking of dawn, which is very interesting because uh, Ibn Abi Jamrah says the breaking of dawn, the falaq, is the revelation is beginning. It's not in full flowering yet. It's just emerging because he had to be prepared for the momentous events that are gonna to happen to him. Because we can't even imagine as a human being seeing an angel fill the entire horizon. I mean, Moses had to, you know, in the Quran it says hayatun tasa'a. In, 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 in one verse it says it was a hayatun tasa'a, then when he threw it down. In, an, in another verse it says it was a thu'ban. When he initially threw it down, it was a small snake so that he wouldn't be afraid. But when he threw it down with Moses, it was a, a thu'ban. So could you imagine him being told, throw down your staff, and then he, he has to experience this thing. The, these are um, human beings that have a capacity that the average human beings, even the most uh, extraordinary human beings, just simply don't have. But he had to be prepared for this. And so, this is a very interesting. And Aisha is, she's, she's so brilliant. And this hadith really brings out a lot of her brilliance. But So he became Alifa Nuska, Wal Ibadata, Wal Khalwata, Wahakatha Nujabao. Imam al Bosayri, he says that the Prophet accustoms himself to Nusuk, to these rituals, um, to, to, to devotion to uh, to ibadah and also to khalwa just to being alone with his lord and then he says this is the way of nujaba intelligent people intelligent people can only take so much of a lot of time because first of all most talk in arabic logha is is from lagha yalghu you know, it's, the verb is, it's just empty talk. If you actually took, looked at what human beings talk on a daily basis, the vast majority of it is just chit chat, uh, backbiting, empty, how much are those onions? You know, that's what people talk. Actually, high talk is not that common to actually be in environments where, and that's why when, when you're with some people, that's all they talk about. They won't go down to that, uh, simple level. Like if you spend time with uh, Sheikh Abdullah bin Bayya, he, he, he just doesn't have chit chat. Murabat al-Hajj had no chit chat. Murabat al-Hajj 
told me that he stopped drinking tea because of the chit chat involved in drinking tea. <laughs> like he just wasn't interested. So these, it doesn't mean, I mean, we're human. So this is, but you have to see that there are people that are selected out amongst human beings. And these are the guides. And, the, and that's why they, they, they just have qualities. And that's one of their qualities is that they, they tend to be introverted. They tend to be more, uh, they just have a hard time. And, and f as you get older, and I guarantee you, you're all, most of you in here are young people. As you get older, you will be less inclined. People, as they get older, tend to withdraw. In fact, in, in Hinduism, it's actually a stage of their life, the last stage where they literally withdraw from society to prepare for death. So they actually had it in their tradition that that's what you did at a certain age. Like they give up rajas food. When they, when they hit 50, they stop eating spiced food. They eat simple food. This is part of preparing for that journey which comes after death, right? Once we die, we have another journey. And, and what uh, Sheikh Abdullah was saying in his khutbah today about when you think about these 14 enemies that he talked about, death is one of these things that we're being con confronted with. And, and the thing about death, you could be 20, you could be 22, you could be 25, you could be 30, you never know. My, my, uh, my head on collision at 17 woke me up to the fact that I could die at any moment in a really ex existential way. So it's just important to remember that we're here for a purpose if we really believe this. And that purpose is, is partly, I mean, not entirely, because there are wonderful things about the world. Family is a wonderful thing. Uh, company is a wonderful thing. Um, all these things are, 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 are beautiful things. But the fundamental reason is we're here to, to do work, to come to know our Lord, to prepare ourselves for what's coming next. So he... And then, and then Imam Abu Sayyidi says, When the hidayah comes into a heart, the limbs become animated with ibadah. The beautiful expression in, in the Hamziyah. When, 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 when it comes into the heart, then, then the limbs spontaneously begin to want to do worship. And so, it's, it could be munsarif or gar munsarif, the two riwayah, bigari hira'a or bigari hira'in. This is called idraj in the hadith tradition. So sometimes the muhaddith will add something for clarification. So for instance, in the, one of the most famous examples that's used in the books is in the hadith of Ibn Majah, where the Prophet ﷺ said, So the wa muslima was added to make sure people didn't misunderstand that hadith because it meant men and women. So the mudraj is an addition that the muhaddith uh, adds for clarification. So he's saying, yatahannathu is an unusual word. I think one of the meanings, wallahu ta'ala alam, al-hinth al-azim is shirk. So in the Quran, hinth is shirk. You know, these false oaths and the, 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 the idols, worship of the idols. Tafa'ul in Arabic, as you learned in sarf, all of the students. One of the meanings of it is to jannub, you know, to avoid something. Like to hajjud is to avoid sleep. Hujud is sleep. So one of the meanings of tahannuth in Arabic is to avoid hinth. Because the Prophet couldn't worship in, 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 in the Kaaba, it was very difficult for him because of all the, the shirk and the idols. So he would go off and he would do this in Ramadan. He would go off and he would worship in Ghar Hira. And one of the secrets of Ghar Hira is in, in the pre-modern world, before the buildings got too high, you could see the Kaaba from Ghar Hira. So he had three acts of worship when he was in Hira. He had the worship of 
khalwa, because there's a hadith that says, al khalwa tu ibadah. Just being alone is a type of worship, which is one of the evils of the cell phone. Because people aren't alone anymore. It's, it's, it's one of the sinister aspects of the qareen. You know, the cell phone's like a qareen. It's, it's with us all the time, this little daemon. They actually call it daemon inside if you go in those, right? And then, and then it opens up. And the Prophet ﷺ said that there's a fitna, man tasharrafa laha tastashrifhu. Whoever opens it, looks at it, it pulls it him in. Wallahi, I think that's the, the, uh, the net. Because you can't go on there for one thing except you find yourself with another thing. And I know everybody in here has had that experience. It's a big problem. If you don't have real discipline, it's a big problem. And you can waste your life. All these poor TikTok people, victims of TikTok, wasting their lives away. Even all this, you know, Twitter, do you really have to have an opinion about everything? Really? Is it that important for you just to put your little comment there? Your two cents that doesn't amount to a hill of beans in the grand scheme of things? It's very interesting. Humans. The, the Imam al-Ghazali said that you should talk when you don't want to talk and you should not talk when you want to talk. One of the best things I heard from one of the students here, uh, uh, everybody had had their opinions. And then I said to her, what do you think? She said, everything I wanted to say has already been said. And I just, Allah Akbar. You know, you don't have to feel compelled to say something. Silence, the Arabs say, إِذَا كَانَ السُّكُوتُ إِذَا كَانَ الْكَرَامُ مِنْ فِضَّةً فَالسُّكُوتُ مِنْ ذَهَبٍ If speech is silver, silence is golden. And the English share that. They probably stole it from the Arabs, like many things, including tea. I mean, they call it English tea. It's not right. <laughs> from India. It's very interesting. So, so, so then, al-layali dhawat al-adad. This is very interesting, and this is the brilliance again of Aisha. The... So these are layali dhawat al-adad. Because adad can be adadu qilla or adadu kathra. So because she phrased it this way, we know that these were multiple nights. It wasn't a few nights. It was multiple nights. Qabla an yanzi'a ila ahlihi. Before he naz'a yanzi'u is to to dhahaba ilay bilishtiyaq. Like you got nuzu'an ilay. One of the Arabs who said... Uh, uh, so Naza'a, he would go to his family with, was, he didn't, she didn't say dhahab. In other words, he wanted to see his family. And this is also partly because you cannot, to do ibadah without fulfilling the huquq on you. Because the, the family has haq. So it was important. And then he, they used to meet and there's a masjid in Mecca where we used to visit when we did the umrahs where Khadija used to meet him as he came down from uh, Jabal Nur, and then she would give him, and uh, the, his zad was ka'ak and zabib. So it was like a bread with uh, simen, not like ka'ak today. Ka'ak is probably from Arabic, cake, cake, ka'ak. But it's a round bread, and zabib, raisins. So, so, hatta uh, al-haq. And then the truth came to him, وَهُوْ فِي غَارِ حِرَى So he was in the, the cave, فَجَأْهُ الْمَلَكِ So the malak came to him. This is Jibreel alayhi salam. فَقَالَ إِقْرَى So Ibn Abi Jamrah says, this is a delil ala jawaz al-tawriya. In balagh al-tawriya is when you say something and you say something ambiguous. Because 
Jibreel, this is for Ta'deeb. Because remember, Allamahu Shadid al Quwa. Even though Jibreel is over, uh, the Prophet ﷺ is over Jibreel. Jibreel is his teacher. And this is something for all of us here as teachers, we know there are students that surpass us. And if you're a true teacher, you want your students to surpass you. You don't want them to, to, to be dependent on you. you. You're teaching them these tools to free them to become independent thinkers themselves, access to the books and things like that. So, so, so the Prophet, his teacher is Jibreel, but he's, he, he's over Jibreel alayhi salam. So, so Jibreel alayhi salam is, this is for ta'deeb, iqara. He knows he can't read. Jibreel knows this. And this is why there's an amazing hadith Imam Siyuti has in his uh, book on Isra, where before the Prophet went on a, a journey, on the Isra and the Mi'raj, he actually had a vision where he was with Jibreel in a tree and they were in like an ish, like a nest. And Jibreel was in one and he was in the other and the tree began to grow until it went into the heavens. And he was looking because everything was opening up to him in the, dun in the uh, unseen. So he was looking, but then he looked at Jibreel and Jibreel was looking straight up. And so he said he learned from him that he should be focused because they were, they were, he was being prepared to, to meet his Lord. And these are the different types of, the ulama actually, there, there are different types of revelation. So the, the first revelation was this ru'ya, a sadiqa, right? The true, true, uh, and, but then there's other types of revelation. There's a revelation that came like sal salat al-jaras. It came like the, the reverberation of a bell. There was one like dawiyya nahl that came like the buzzing of a bee. It also, there's the nafatha fi ru'i. The Prophet ﷺ said, Inna ruh al Qudus nafatha fi ru'i. He, 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 he uh, breathed into my heart. Ru' is heart. Ru' is fear. Related. Nafatha fi ru'i. Alla tamuta nafsun hatta tastakmira. Rizquhu wa ajaruhu. Fa ajmiru fi tarab. So he was inspired. This is a type of wahi that's akin to ilham. It just comes into his heart and he knows it. So he was inspired to know that the soul will not die until it completes its provision and its ajal. And so he said, فَأَجْمِلُوا فِي الطَّلَبِ So don't, don't be aggressive, don't be greedy, don't, be, don't go and uh, ask people for things. Everything will come to you. إِن كُنْتَ إِذَا سَأَلْتَ فَاسْأَلِ اللَّهِ if you ask, then ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So he said that um, so then he so yatazawudu thumma yarji'u ila khadijata fa yatazawudu li mithriha so then he would go back to the house and Ibn Abi Jamra says this is a proof that the, the inqita' doesn't the fact that you go for needs does not break your ibadah, because he would return. So it's like when you're in the mu'takif, these are ahkam al-i'tikaf. When you're in, in the i'tikaf, if you have something, it doesn't break your i'tikaf to do something out of necessity. فَقَالِ iqra. So the tawriya is, is uh, yatawara. You know, it's something you're, it's just ambiguous, right? Uh, and so, and, and he, he said the condition though is that you don't harm anybody with this. So when he said, Iqra, he said, Ma ana biqari. I don't know how to read. The beauty of Arabic also, I mean, of the many beauties, but one of the beauties is that words uh, are sometimes extremely precise when, when necessary, and then other times they're very um, loose. They hold a lot of different. But in the, in the case of Qara, yaqra'u, uh, it, it means to both recite and to read. So the Quran is a it's, it's a reading and a recital. So it's said from by by rote, but it's all and that's that's uh, traditionally uh, the Muslims fi sudur al ladin al ilm. It was something they carried in their breast, 
but it's also a Quran is also a, a recital, a reading. So you read it, Iqra. So he said, There's different riwayah. This, I think, is the strongest one. So the fa'il goes back to, um, to uh, the angel. Or it could be, بَلَغَ مِنِّي الْجَهْدُ يَعْنِي مَبْلَغًا عَظِيمًا For those of you who are doing Arabic here. ثُمَّ أَرْسَلَنِي And then he let me go. He released me. So غَطَّ is, is, is it's ضَمَّهُ وَعَصَرَهُ it's, it's to pull him in and then to squeeze him. And, and until he thought he was going to burst. That's how intense it was. So, so, and Jibreel, you, we can't imagine the Shadid al Quwa. That's how he's described in the Quran. Shadid al Quwa. So, you can't even imagine what kind of pressure that was. Abu Bakr was once with the Prophet when the revelation came, and he thought his thigh, that he was going to break his, uh, his, his uh, femur. It was the, the waiting. Sanulqi alayka qawlan thaqila. We will thrust upon you a weighty word. It's, it had a physical weight as well. So, so, And then, until he thought he was going to burst, and then he, let, he released him. He did it three times. ثم أرسلني. So the three times, there's a sir in the three times. Uh, Ibn Abi Jamra says that these are, this is what they, they call takhliya. So in, 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 in our tradition, you have what's called takhliya. I mean, the Christians have a very similar concept, kenosis, of emptying out emptying out bad qualities. So, takhliya yatakhalla. And look where the dot is. It's on the top. Right? It's on the top. So, the takhliya is to empty out yatakhalla, to empty out. So, there's, there's, there's nothing inside of bad qualities. I mean, the Prophet was, a, was pure, but this is, these all have meanings. So, that squeezing is, is the first one, the takhliya. And then the, the second is the tahliya. This is all of the positive qualities. So the beginning of the path is takhliya, and then the, 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 the middle stage is tahliya. So you, first you get rid of your vices, and then you work on adorning yourself with all of the, the virtues. What are called yatahalla bi maqamat al yaqeen. Right? You, Ibn Ashir says yatahalla bi maqamat al yaqeen. Khawfun rajun, shukurun wa sabrun tawba, zuhdun tawakkurun, ridan mahabba. These are the, the, the qualities that were meant to inculcate these nine qualities that are related in our tradition of fear and hope and gratitude and patience, you know, trust in Allah, detachment from this dunya being content with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, and finally, mahabba, where you have pure love for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, and, and ghayr is, is removed from your heart. Khala min qalbihi, wa ghayru khala min qalbihi, it's outside of his heart, uh, other, just anything other than Allah. And then it becomes, you can handle this, because Aisha radiallahu anhu, if you look at Aisha, I mean, look what she went through. I mean, this is an aristocrat, she's from this, incredible family. Her father is the most upright after the Prophet ﷺ of all the Muslims. And she's accused of, of, uh, of adultery. And Allah says, don't think it's bad. It's good for you. That's part of the process. There are many things. People are going to be slandered, attacked. Somebody uh, talked to me yesterday and he, and he he's, was slandered horribly. And, and, and then removed from his position and everything. And I told him, I said, Subhanallah, you know, honey and lakum. Like I really meant it. You know, this is what happens to prophets. 
you know, you can go through life and nobody ever says uh, anything bad about you. Doing something wrong. <laughs> this, this is the dunya. The, the people of Allah are always attacked. They have enemies. And, and, and they'll tell horrible things. They'll tell lies. They don't care. These people are minions of the devil. They, they say without proof, without evidence, they attack people. They had no proof. Aisha lost her necklace. She was very light, so they didn't feel the camel. And then the poor man, you know, Mustah, he's, he's like walking. In the right when he saw her, he said, inna lillahi, in, wa inna ilahi raji'un. Like he knew it was a musibah. And then he, he took her to the Prophet Sallallahu And then, the, ah, the chatterers. This is sick people. And now they have, if, think if they had internet. <laughs> now they have internet. I mean, the devil, what tools he has today. In the past, it all had to be, it took time. Now the Prophet said, He'll speak, tell a lie, and then it instantaneously goes to the horizons. You just push a little button. But Yom Qiyam is real, and we're going to see who's who. All, you know, all the phonies are going to be shown up. They're going to be shown up. There are going to be people that will have flags coming out of their rear ends of, the, of the, the treacherous people, out of their rear ends. So everybody can see Ghadr. You know, it's going to be a good day. It's going to be a good day. If, if you're, as long as you're a, a mu'min and you have taqwa of Allah, it's going to be a good day. And, and everybody will get what they, what, hopefully not what they deserve, but the bad people will get what they deserve. The good people, hopefully, they're going to be forgiven. But those people that sowed dissension, sowed corruption, spread rumors, told lies, started wars, killed people mercilessly. I mean, these people now, what they're doing in these different places. La ظلم اليوم. There's no oppression on that day. Why would Allah say that? Because this is a world, this is an abode where there's going to be difficulties. This is the nature of the abode. So, so then he said, Read, this is what he was meant to recite. In the name of your Lord, So Ibn Abi Jamra says, this is a proof that iman bidun nadar wa dalil yasbiqul iman bin nadar wa dalil because it didn't say you know unduru fi samawati wal ard look into the heavens and the earth contemplate no iqra bismi rabbika alladhi khalaq so he says it's that that another wal istidlal shartu kamal wa laysa shartu saha wa laysa shartu saha it's it's the condition of 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 a complete or perfected iman, not the condition of uh, of soundness of iman. And then insan min alaq wa fi anfusikum sirun. So Allah goes from the Lord to the self. Sanurihim ayatina fil afaqi wa fi anfusim hatta yatabayyana lahum anhu al haq. Awram yakfi bi rabbika anhu ala kulli shayin shahid. He will, Allah will show us signs. In the self and on the horizon. In the self and on the horizon. Until it becomes clear to them that this is the truth. So what is the relationship between the self and the horizon? The relationship is it's the meeting place of heaven and earth. So you are a heavenly being and an earthly being in a khalq jadid. We're a new creation. We have an immaterial reality that's heavenly, and we have a material, physical reality that's earthly. And that's why when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in Surah Al-Rum that uh, in the creation of the heavens and the earth, and in the diversities of your complexions and your tongues and your complexions, yeah. So, so 
in the creation of the heavens and the earth and in your tongues and your complexions are signs for people who are alimin, rational beings, people that use their intellect. So that's called tibaq. So he has heaven and earth and then language and complexions. This is because our consciousness, our thought is immaterial. That's from the heavens. The complexions, all the white, the brown, the black, the yellow, the red, that's all from the earth. It's all earthly. And that's why heavenly people don't give a lot of credence to uh, complexion. It doesn't ha it's just from the earth. I mean, there's, there's albino pigs, there's white pigs. Does, does that make, give them some kind of ontological status over brown pigs? It's ridiculous. But this is stupidity of our species. And, and also, uh, this is a minions, you know, Iblis, uh, tricking people. Like, because he literally says, what am I going to bow down to black, smelly clay? I mean, he, he use, uses the word black. He's like, hmm. Because what color is smoke as fire? The, the hottest fire, it's, it goes, it's, gets white. So racism, racism is really Iblisism. It's, that's all it is. It's just Iblis thinking he's better because of something elemental, something related to the, the material phenomenon, not the spiritual. And that's why in the Alamun Mala Ta'alamun, Allah knew what they didn't know. They're, they're looking at, at, at the outward of Adam alayhi salam. أَتَجَعْلُ فِيهَا مَنْ يُسْفِدُ فِيهَا وَيَسْفِكُ الدِّمَاءِ You're going to put in the earth the one that sows corruption and sheds blood? Mm, not all of them. Some are going to do that. خَرَقَ الْإِنسَانُ مِنْ عَرَقِ إِقْرَأْ وَرَبُّكَ لَأْكَرَمْ فَرَجَعَ بِهَا رَسُولُ اللَّهِ يَرْجُفُ فُوَعْدُهُ رَجَفَ يَرْجُفُ This is خَفَقَان So he's having palpitations and this happens when you, you have like acute anxiety, something so we can't imagine this experience that's happening to the Prophet none of us can imagine that so he goes فَدَخَلَ عَلَى خَدِيجَ بِنْتِ خَوَيْدَتْ This is his his cousin, and he's married to her, they, they meet in uh, uh, Abdul Uzza and Abdul Manaf were brothers. So they're both sons of Qusay. So they, they both go back to Qusay. And this, these are tribal uh, clan people, which is very common. And then, uh, anha. so that's where he goes. He goes t to the, the one that is going to give him solace of what this is. Zammiluni, zammiluni. Uh, Ibn Abi Jamar has a beautiful latifa that he used the mudhakkar, jam' al-mudhakkar as-salim, right? Jam' uh, al-mudhakkar fil fi'l al-amr. So he, he said uh, that zammiluni is, is for plural and, and, and then it's, it's masculine, but it's said to Khadija because of her maqam. Because when, when, first of all, when you speak to people um, w that you have great respect for in the Arabic language, you use the plural. Like in Spanish, you, you, say, you use the third person. You know, you, you say like, como esta usted? You don't say, como esta, esta, and, you know, how are you doing? You say, como esta, how is the, the, the teacher doing or the usted, the sir, doing? You do it in third person. Many tr traditional cultures have this. I mean, in Urdu, you need like a PhD to work out all the different, because um, they have all the, even your birth order is gonna determine what you're called in traditional uh, Urdu. So, so, so that's, so he says, Zambiluni, Zambiluni, hatta dhahab anhu ar So he has this, this fright. This is a ru'a. فقال, فقال لي خديجة فأخبرها الخبر This is Aisha's فصاحة اختصرت She just says فأخبرها الخبر 
she doesn't need to say akhbaru wa ana al-malak ja wa ana to repeat it because she's already said that so she says fa akhbaraha al-khabar now the ijaz as opposed to iqnab now this to me is one of the most beautiful um it's it's just so powerful because he says laqad khashitu ala nafsi i'm afraid for myself like what's happening to me and she says kalla wallahi la yughzik allah abada this is like a forceful negation kalla there's no way no wallahi swearing an oath ma yughzik allah abada your lord will never degrade you he will never humiliate you he will never do anything to you that is unwarranted abada and then she says why innaka la tasiru rahim you take care of your relatives you know you maintain the bonds you help your relatives when they're in need you maintain those kinship bonds wa tahmil al kal allah talks about the kalluna ala maulahu the the one who's just ajiz he can't do anything he's just reliant she said you bear the burdens of the weary the people that just can't take care of themselves wa taksib al ma'dum في رواية تكسب المعدوم وتكسب المعدوم and then this is really uh, the the معدم but they're using what they don't have to to mean so it's you earn or you give تكسب المال للمعدم you you help those who have nothing by giving them something وتقري الضيف قراءة is the قراءة قراءة يقري الضيف is 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 to be a good host like you prepare for the the guest their needs not just food but it also can mean like protection and so taqri al-dayf and this is one of the hallmarks of the arab people of all peoples you know the arabs one of my teachers he was an arab but it's a true statement and i as an ajami like uh, i'll say like um, ibn muqaffa when he was asked he was a persian but he, he knew beautiful arabic he said لأن أسب بالعربية أحب إلي من أن أن أمدح ب لأن أسب بالعربية أحب إلي أن أمدح بالفارسية. I'd rather be cursed in Arabic than um, praised in Persian. Sorry, Fridan. Yeah. And then he was asked once about which uh, you know which. Uh, people he preferred he said alladhi fatani min an-nasab lam yafutni min al-aql al-arab he said what i what i don't have in my lineage at least i have in intellect because we we hub al-arab min al-iman to we're not shi'ubiya you know the shi'ubiya these were people that didn't like the arabs hub al-arab min al-iman no matter how they're they're the prophet's people and 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 whatever difficulties they're going through and things like that we pray for them and 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 their language is our language and then he's and then she said what to ino ana nawaib al haq and you help people in these nawaib al haq the reason again she said nawaib al haq because nawaib like labib the poet he says nawaibu min khairin wa min sharrin kilahuma there's nawaib al khair wa nawaib al sharr and there's nawaib al batil and nawaib al haq so you help in those things that are related to the truth the calamities that come that befall people so then she said fan taraqat bihi khadijatu hatta atat bihi waraqata ibn nawfil ibn asad ibn abd al uzza so this is uh, the cousin of khadija she's bint al khawalid and that's the brother of his uh, father and and so 
but they both meet with the Prophet at uh, Qusay, which some say is the beginning of Quraysh. So I'm going to take it back to Quraysh, Qusay. Um, so, so, كان إمرأ تنصر في الجاهلية. He had become a Christian in Jahiliya. وكان يكتب الكتاب العبراني. He could write in Hebrew. ويكتب من الإنجيل بالعبرانية, which indicates this must have been one of the original uh, Anajir, because the Injil was probably in either Aramaic or, or Hebrew, not in uh, Greek, which is what it is today, Koine Greek. ما شاء أن يكتب وكان شيخا كبير he was an old man قد عمي فقالت له خديجة يا ابن عم oh my cousin the Arabs say that يا ابن عم to their cousin and then they say to the older person عم my uncle even if it's not their uncle just an older person عم or or عمة or خال or خالة and and then uh, so she said Isma' min ibn akhik, listen to your cousin, because they're cousin by Qusay. Faqala lahu waraqatu, ya ibn akhi. Oh, my, my, my son of my brother, my cousin. Mada tara, what, what are you seeing? Faqbaruhu Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, khabar ma ra'a. So he told him what he'd seen. Faqala lahu waraqatu, hadha namus. So waraqa was educated in, in, uh, in Abrahamic revelation. He said, this is the Namus. Namus, there's different opinions about it. Some say it means Jibril. This is Jibril. Some say it means the actual Wahi. It may be related to Nomos, which is the law, the coming of the law, um, because this is what the Arabs did not have. Aladhi nazzal Allahu ana Musa, ya laytani fiha jada'a. I wish I was a, he says jada'a which is a, a, like a young, a, you know, a young sprightly billy goat or something. It's a saghirun min al-baha'im. So I wish I was a youngster, he's saying, that I could be with you when your people drive you out. Qala Rasulullah, awa mukhrijiyahum? He can't imagine this. This is the... A gentle, he's the most gentle of people. He doesn't bother anybody. He only does good. He's, he's the alameen. Nobody has a bad word to say about him. He can't imagine what, a mukhrijiyah home? And he said, nah. Because no man brings what you're bringing to them except he will be opposed. وَإِنْ يُدْرِكْنِ يَوْمُكَ If I was with you on that day, أَنْصُرْكَ نَصْرًا مُؤَزْرًا I will, I will protect you, I will defend you in a, in a, a strong way. ثُمَّ لَمْ يَنْشَبْ But just he didn't, مَا نَشِبَ You know, he, he died right after that. ورقة, because he had knowledge of the, none of the people around the Prophet ﷺ had knowledge of, uh, of the books. Because people would accuse and say, oh, he got it from this person or that person. Even where all the Midras teaching, well, how did he get all that knowledge? Because that's in their oral revelation. How did he know all those stories? And they're consistent with, the, with what the Jews have. How did he know those things? He didn't learn it from the Jews. And then وفتر الوحي And then the wahi, the wahi um, and حبس عنه for a period. There's difference of opinion about how long it was. And then he, uh, he adds that Ibn Shihab, uh, Imam al-Zuhri is one of the great scholars. أخبرني أبو سلمة ابن عبد الرحمن أن جابر بن عبد الله الأنصاري قال هو وهو يحدث عن فترة الوحي فقال في حديثه بين أنا أمشي سمعت صوتا من السماء فرفعت بصري فإذا الملك الذي جاءني بحراء جارس على كرسي بين السماء والأرض فروعبت منه فرجعت فقلت زملوني فأنزل الله تعالى يا أيها المزمل يا أيها المدثر قم فأنذر 
إلى قوله والرجس أو الرجس فهجر فحمي الوحي وتتابع and then so then he said after that he he saw the angel again on a uh, filling up the horizon on a throne between the heavens and the earth and again he ran back and said زميلوني زميلوني and and that's when Allah said يا أيها المدثر and that's something that's istinas so the Arabs in the Arabic language you like the Prophet ﷺ once came upon Sayyidina Ali and he was uh, he was sleeping uh, and 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 he woke him up and he had dust all over him and he called him oh, ya ba turab qum so so the arabs the hal that your mutadabbis bihi the arabs will will to kanik be bil hal so like abu huraira had the cat that he was holding so the prophet called him abu huraira so there's something that in arabic they do so ya yuhan muzammil it's 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 the hal that he was in. He was muzammil uh, when, when he was being called. Alhamdulillah. So that's, uh, I wanted to read one thing that I just, it's very powerful. And I just thought, um, this is just a really extraordinary insight from uh, Dr. Cleary. Allah irhamu. She said, uh, he said that um, Khadija, who was not only the first wife of the Prophet Muhammad, but also his only wife during her lifetime, was a successful international businesswoman. Twice widowed before marrying the Prophet, at one time the astute and self possessed Khadija employed the young Prophet to be in her business which she had inherited from her father when she was 30 years old. Through their professional relationship, Khadija became well acquainted with the morals and characters of her future husband. Although she was already 40 years, there's a khilaf about that. I mean, there's some tahqiq that she was younger than 40. Um, she was more closer to uh, 30. When she and Muhammad were married, Khadija bore him six children. Their first child, a son, died at the age of two. Their last child, also a son, died in infancy. The saintly Fatima, mother of the Imams, was the youngest of their four daughters. Khadija and Muhammad had been married for 15 years by the time he began to receive revelations during his meditation in a mountain cave outside Mecca. Muhammad was already a mature man of 40, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, known in the community for his reliability. But what he experienced in the cave created a profound turmoil. It was to Khadija, beloved wife and mother of his children, that he hastened Retaining his own, her own composure and keeping her presence of mind, Khadija calmed the nascent prophet, reminding him of his reputation for trustworthiness and assuring him that this could not be something like maladiyat, as he had first feared. Like he said, akhsha ala nafsi. That he was, what he was worried about, that he was going to become a kahin. You know, kahana was something that the Arabs, they had these people that like got a... Uh, a type of, uh, you know, the jinn would give them information and things. And that's initially what he was afraid of. And there's, you know, there are traditions. A lot of uh, the scholars will attack them, but they, they're they related by scholars, Imam al-Bayhaqi, Ibn Abi Jamra, that the Prophet, you know, that he was really troubled and uh, was, was in a, a really almost despondent state of mind at one point. Um, there, there's, uh, and these are debatable things, but the point is, He's he's of the but he's also a bashar. He's a human being with, you know, he had feelings as a human being. He had grief. He had sorrow. He had pain. Um, he, I mean, his waka was worse. He said he had uh, twice the pain of the average person when he got sick. So uh, I think people sometimes forget that. But he says beneath the color and drama of this famous incident lies a reminder of a human reality whose poignancy is in, inescapable, regardless of how one may feel about the reality of prophecy. He's talking to non-Muslims, uh, which this book was written for, so I think it's important to see that in that light. And that is the plight of a woman whose husband, the father of her children, it, it, he's in this state 
He's just in this incredible state. And even if divinely inspired, his first thought of, is this a type of madness? How sublime must have been that sobriety? And how profound the insight of the woman who saw the truth of the matter and did not waver or doubt, like she just no doubt. I mean, just to have that support of Khadija. If she had plunged into anxiety or fear, as any ordinary human being might understandably do under the circumstances, the intense agitation and distress what, what, what would have happened? The sustaining wisdom and fortitude of this exemplary woman would have far-reaching consequences. Over the next 10 years until her death at the age of 65, Khadija continued to maintain her unflinching loyalty and steadfastness as the wife of the prophet. And the first to embrace Islam at any age, at an age when she might reasonably have expected to enjoy the fruits of her labor, including a comfortable life and domestic tranquility. Instead, Khadija shared the pains of ostracization and persecution visited upon the family and the followers of Muhammad by opponents of his message. Khadija did not live to see Islam's ultimate triumph. But this only highlights the purity and power of her certitude. As though her spiritual perception had penetrated the veil of time, Khadija's outstanding strength of character as mother of the believers shines through the darkness of those days of trial as a beacon of a brighter future. As a truly exemplary woman, she is not obscured by the brilliance of her husband in his prophetic role. As we see in her, in her in tradition, the light of the revelation is reflected in the clear mirror of her spiritual perception, which had sensed the verity of the message from the very first. By virtue of her qualities, therefore, Khadija became the first earthly matrix of the historical dissemination of the message through her partner, the prophet. Just forget how important she was. You know? Just to have that solace. Alhamdulillah. Subhanallah. That's why no matter how dark it gets, I mean, she had to suffer. They ate leaves of trees, you know. They were tortured. Uh, Sumaya, Alyasa, Sabran Alyasa in the Mu'adhukum Jannah. The Prophet saw them being tortured. He didn't tell all his Sahaba to kill themselves, to save them. He, he told them, your, your destiny is Jannah. We can't do anything right now to help you. The same with Aisha when she, you know, people, um, people misunderstand that. Just that sometimes you, you have to just bear these nawaib, you know, these difficulties and just recognize that there's not a lot you can do other than just trust in Allah and believe in, in this revelation and that, you know, that it's true, that it's, it's haqq. So you can look at the Muslims now. I mean, it's actually a nice time to be a Muslim. You know why? Because there's really not a lot of perks in being a Muslim. And, and so, you know, there used to be a time when people, you know, there's all these perks to become Muslim. So, so this is a time, this is like one of those early periods where we're, we're persecuted all over the place. People don't like Muslims. You know, it's, what a blessing. Because the faith, then it's 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 real. It's not because uh, you know you're ruling the world, which so many Muslims for some reason want to do. I don't know why. I don't want to rule this world. Yeah. 
Any uh, questions? Comments? Alhamdulillah. It's an amazing story. The beginning of Wahi. And he began his book with this. It's beautiful. Fadal. Assalamu alaikum, Shaykh. Alaykum Barakallahu feek for your dars, mashallah. I think we all benefited a lot from it. In light of what you said about waraqa, uh, could you comment on the relationship that the early Muslims had with Christians? Because I know there's the trend where some people will say the ummah included Christians and Jews without them exactly becoming Muslims. Yeah. Well, it says that they, the, when they made the Pact of Medina, it says, hum ummatum ma'an muslimin. So there's a whole khilaf about what that ma'a means. And you have to study huruf and ma'ani to appreciate. So, um, you know, I, I was present in a debate between two great scholars about that ma'a. Um, so did it mean it was one ummah or did it mean they were two separate ummah? And, and they were both valid from a grammatical point of view. Um, in any case, we're distinct from the Jews and the Christians. The Prophet Sallallahu made it very clear that we should distinguish ourselves from the Jews and the Christians. There's no Abrahamic, uh, we're united by Abraham, but we are distinct branches. And, and our belief is that the, the, the Jewish branch, Judaism, um, deviated and Christianity deviated. And that's, that's our truth claim. And people can t take it or leave it, that's fine, but that's a truth claim. Um, the Jews don't accept the Christians and the Christians don't seem to have a problem with that. <laughs> and they don't, I mean, if you read Jesus in the Talmud, it's pretty shocking the punishments Jesus gets. I mean, if you read what's said about Mary, it's pretty intense, but nobody seems to have a problem amongst the Christians. But for some reason, Muslims are hammered because we don't accept Judaism and Christianity as valid uh, religions today. We believe they were abrogated. That's our truth claim. But the beauty of this religion is you don't have to believe that. Even in our own tradition, we can't force you to believe that. You have your choice. And we can live together. The Muslims have always had, they've never had a problem with living with other communities. In fact, John Locke's Treatise on Toleration came directly from studying the Ottoman uh, millet system. Europe learned toleration, religious toleration from the Muslims. And that's Edward Pocock, who was his teacher at Oxford. Edward Pocock had studied Islam for several years in Aleppo. And he went back to England, this is the 17th century, and he brought a library of 400 Arabic manuscripts, which is now the Edward Pocock uh, Arabic Manuscript Library at Oxford. He was the teacher of uh, John Locke. John Locke wrote the treatise on toleration. So Muslims taught the world how to tolerate. I mean, the Romans were reasonably good, but, uh, but you basically had to accept they would allow you to put your gods into their pantheon of gods. You know, that was the deal. So, you know, as long as you, and that's why the Jews were, were very often persecuted because they separated themselves. So the truth claims of Islam are very clear. There's no ambiguity, but Muslims learned a lot from the Jews, they learned a lot from the Christians and vice versa. So there's no reason why there can't be uh, benefit uh, and respect. I mean, we have our truth claim. We're not, we, can't, we can't just reject our religion to, to suit you. I mean, that's not really fair. But, you know, that, that's the reality of it. So, you know, alhamdulillah. They're, they're, you know, Yom Qiyamah, Allah says we're all going to be told why we were differing, what all this meant. Uh, and it's, we just need to wait and be patient. These are truth claims. I'm very convinced. I mean, I, I have, you know, my yaqeen in my heart about this truth claim. I believe it. And, um, you know, the early Christian, um, they had very good relations 
uh, outside of the Byzantines. The Byzantines did not like the Muslims because the Byzantines were persecuting all of the, the other sects who they viewed as heretics, the Nestorians. You know, there were all these different um, sects uh, of, uh, of Christians that were persecuted. When the Muslims came, they said, no, you're all fine. We don't have a problem with you. And they let them worship. And that's why that wonderful book that was written by the Stanford scholar, When C Christians First Met Muslims, shows that they, they really, um, they, 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 uh, they, they actually shared prayer space because the Muslims uh, needed prayer space. There was a whole iconoclastic movement where the Christians, because of the influence of Islam, started destroying all the idols. So none of the churches at that time had idols in them. So the Muslims used to pray in the churches. It was very interesting. Jews cannot pray in a church. Orthodox Jews cannot pray in a church. They can pray in a masjid. It was very interesting. They don't talk about those things, but that's, that's the reality. Because we're not idolaters. Whereas in the Jewish tradition, Christians are seen as idolaters. Whereas we don't see them as idolaters per se because we can marry them. You can't marry an idolater. And we can eat their food. But, you know, they, they have a, 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 a serious misunderstanding. I mean, there are, and I know there's a khilaf about that, but I prefer the opinion that doesn't put them in that camp in any case. Any other Ahmed Khan. Jazakallah khair, Sheikh. What I'm wondering is, what is the name of the religion prior to the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa That they were practicing? Yeah, because like, the Quran will often refer to uh, Ibrahim, Milla, Ibrahim. Ibrahim, Deen al-Qayyim. Yeah. Um, so what was the name? And I've heard some scholars use the terms Islam Am and Islam Khas. Yeah. I mean, there's a lot of debates about these things. The, the Hanif are the people that had a natural inclination to Tawheed. So the Hunafa were people on the Arabian Peninsula that, uh, like Qas ibn Sa'idah, people like that, who, who just, they, they knew God was one. They weren't idolaters. They believed in an afterlife. They were, they were what would be called in Judaism Noahides. They're like Noahidic people. Um, there were definitely Christians. The Christians of Najran were there. There were Monophysites. The, the Ethiopians were probably, you know, Monophysites. They, so they're, they're that, the group that's now called, uh, I mean, they don't like to be called Monophysites, so I don't want to insult anybody. Um, but the, uh, the Coptic Church, you know, they have a belief in the, the divinity of Christ. So I, you know, the, the, the Islam, Siyuti says Islam was the religion of the prophets. All the prophets are Muslimun. That's Ibrahim alayhi salam. So all the, all, the, all the prophets were Muslim, meaning they were in a state of submission to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Islam as a soci sociological category, like Islam where you check the box, what religion do you practice? That sociological category has a distinction. Whereas, you know, aslam to wajhi lillah, you're saying you're in a state of submission to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So, so, so then you have the Muslim and then you have the Muslim camel. So the Muslim camel would be one who, and that's why, don't say, you believe, but say you've entered into the faith. That's the sociological category that you're in. You're, 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 you're defined distinct from other peoples. And in that way, uh, the other religions aren't Islam. But in the way that they were in submission to Allah, you know, the Christians pray in the Lord's Prayer, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our day. Thy will be done. In other words, I want to be aligned with your will, which is Islam in, in, in the sense of the mustar of aslama, the fi'l, like really doing it, as opposed to the sociological category of designating yourself as a Muslim distinct from other religions. In that way, we're the only Muslims. Does that make sense? Yeah. Any other ladies? A few more, I'm fine, yeah. What, what time's the prayer here?
Jazakallah khairan. Um, I had a question about Warak bin Nawfal. Um, I was I was wondering, do we know if he became a Muslim the same way like Abu Bakr radiallahu anhu and Khadija radiallahu anhu had converted? Because um, you said he he passed away soon after. Yeah, yeah, no, he was Muslim. Okay. I mean, so he accepted the Prophet's eyes. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Any other questions? Right there, Fatima too. Assalamualaikum. Um, you mentioned that there were three acts of worship that the Prophet ﷺ engaged yeah. in when he retreated to. And I only mentioned two. You only mentioned one. Oh, <laughs> good for you. That's a good catch. So there was there was the khalwa, and then there was the tahannuth, which we don't really know what he was actually doing. It was probably some form of what today we would call meditation or invocation. And then the third was nazar il al -bayts. The Prophet ﷺ said to look at the Kaaba is an act of ibadah. So he was looking at the house of Allah from the cave. But good catch. Yeah. I'm, I'm, I've been notoriously known to do that. My only um, uh, solace in that is there's a famous hadith where the Prophet ﷺ talked about the three um, evil murders, and, and there are only two mentioned in the hadith. So some say, I mean, obviously it was the Rawi that forgot. Because <laughs> the Prophet ﷺ wouldn't forget. Any other? Assalamu alaikum, Sheikh. Um, I just had a quick question. Um, did, did the Prophet Sallallahu question how um, Waraka bin Nafal knew what he knew about the Prophet? Like, did he like, um, like was there ever an instance where he came across the Injil? Like, did he like read it? I, I, don't, there, I don't have any indication of that. Okay. He knew, there's a very famous hadith. It's a problematic hadith, but I, I think it's a true hadith. But, you know, because the, and the synods are very strong for it where the Prophet ﷺ was asked about the mala al-ala, fima yakhtasimun, like what are, the, what are they debating about? And the Prophet said uh, to his Lord, and this is a dream, so this is, this is a type, one of the eight types of revelation where the, Allah speaks directly to the Prophet in his dream. And, and, uh, and this happened to Ahmed ibn Hanbal, so we know that, that uh, that this is uh, ja'iz. So Allah asked him, and the Prophet said, La adri, I don't know. And, and so the hadith says, yaduhu bayna katifayhi. And, and he felt the coolness of it in, 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 his, in, in his breast. And then he said, Wa alimtu kulla shay. I knew everything. And in riwayah, alimtu ma fi samawati wa ard. I knew what was in the heavens and the earth. And then he said, Madi yakhtasimun, and he said, Anad kafarat. He, he, he said, what they were uh, discussing were the things that remove sins of people. And then he said, uh, wudu ala al makari, like um, doing wudu when it's difficult. And then, intidhar uh, salah like staying in the masjid after the prayer, waiting for the next prayer. That's a kafara from sins. So that, that hadith indicates that the Prophet ﷺ, he had knowledge of, I mean, the Quran is a mukhtasar of all the previous revelations. So he, he knew all the previous revelations. In the same way, Jesus, they don't know where Jesus learned the Torah because he began to teach in the synagogue and the rabbis were saying, Who, where'd you learn this from? Because they all have chain, the, they knew. And, but Isa السلام, was taught directly. So that's the thing about the prophets. They know things directly. They have direct communication. But there's no indication. And I think the reason that, I mean, Khadija in her genius, uh, her, you know, her brilliance, she, she took him to the person that she knew 
could explain to him what was happening to him. Because he just, all he needed was to be reassured because this was such a traumatic experience. I mean, it was zamiruni, zamiruni. You know, he was shaking and his heart, the palpitations. And so she knew exactly what to do. That's why it's so amazing what she did. So, so he, but, and there's no indication that he, he would have uh, questioned that. I mean, there were many signs. The Irhasat were all there. The Irhasat or the Mu'jizat before he actually got the direct revelation when he was a Buhaira, the Rahib al Buhaira, the monk who knew he was a prophet. Um, also, the cloud cover, um, you know, the, his, his servant on the way to uh, Syria, he saw the cloud cover. Many, many examples of that. And he began around the age of 38, he started hearing um, inanimate things. Which is very interesting because you find that in a lot of traditions. You know, just the inanimate world opening up. Um, there's a very interesting in Burhan al Mu'ayyad of. Uh, of um, Imam al-Rifai, somebody asked him, you know, do inanimate things, is there any sentience in them? And he said yes, and he didn't believe him. So he said when he put down his cup too hard, he heard the cup go, ouch. <laughs> Which is very interesting because the Prophet treated things very gently, like he didn't throw anything, he didn't, it's very interesting, like just... I mean, that's a very, uh, a lot of native traditions have that understanding. Allahu Alam, Allah knows best. Makarih al wudu right? The, uh, the Mauritanians, they say, fi shiddat al bardi wa illat al badan wa qillat al ma'i wa halat al wasan wa ajarat min amrih al muhimmi tilk al makarihu min ghayri wahmi. The isbagr wudu is from the kafarat, so it's when you when 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 it's cold and you do wudu, it's a kafara for sins. When when you're not feeling well and it's not dangerous to do wudu, you know, because you can do tayammum, but you do it nonetheless. And then uh, when uh, when. Uh, And then when, when, when you're tired, like extremely tired, and you do those are all. And then when you're in a hurry, like some of these very quick, yeah, and you stop and do it. Because wudu should preferably not be rushed. Some people rush wudu. I always told people, you know, I, I didn't learn wudu. I mean, I learned wudu when I first became Muslim. In fact, it was one of the very first things I did um, when, when I, uh, before I even became Muslim they had me do wudu, which was very interesting. I, and they did it properly, like they had me sit down with a maqaraj, you know, like a, a pot to do it. Because um, much better done uh, sitting down than just standing up. Sunnah is to do it sitting down or sitting on a stool. But the, the, I didn't really know wudu until I saw Marabd al-Hajj do wudu. Because then I realized wudu is a it's a distinct, it's a ibadah mustaqillah. It's a distinct act of worship. It's not, it's its own thing. It's not just preparation for the prayer. It's a distinct act of ibadah. And it's a very interesting act of ibadah. And that's why the Prophet did wudu ala wudu. He, he did it over wudu. He didn't need to do it, but he would do wudu ala wudu. Even when he was in wudu. Barakallah fikum, inshallah, may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala give us tawfiq, forgive us our wrong actions, uh, bring us closer to Allah and His Messenger. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, inshallah, to bless this month and our efforts in this month, forgive us our transgressions, our weaknesses, our bad habits. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, inshallah, just bless these people that are really suffering uh, in these different places, our brothers and sisters in Gaza. Allah, give them relief, inshallah, give them solace in their hearts that Allah's 
would never abandon people that say la ilaha illallah muhammad rasulullah may allah subhanahu wa ta'ala inshallah um, give some uh, aid to the people of darfur really struggling there and all these different places we know in yemen in kashmir in uh, in libya there's still many problems our iraqi brothers the syrian brothers and sisters the Palestinians in the West Bank, may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala protect them because unfortunately Allah knows you know, people that anybody that has any bad intention for Masjid Al-Aqsa, Allahumma khudhu akhda aziz and muqtadir, ya Allah Allahumma ja'al kaydahum fi nuhurihim Allahumma hafad al-bayt al-maqdis wa ahlihi ya Allah so Allah tahfad al-bayt al-maqdis wa tahfad ahluhu يا رحم الرحيمين اللهم إن شاء الله تقبل منا صيامنا وقيامنا وركوعنا وسجودنا وتلاوتنا وجعل القرآن جار على أنسنتنا يا رحم الرحيمين سبحان ربك رب العزة عما يصفون والسلام على المسلمين والحمد لله رب العالمين